Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, this week we talked about beautiful art. Mm-hmm. That being the Lao Kun and his sons, or the Lao Kun, or Lao Kun. It gets called many different things. I saw the Lao Kun group a lot. Yes. I don't love that name, which is why I didn't use it, even though I understand why it is used by art historians, because it is a group of figures. I don't know. It sounds like a weird corporate name in a sci-fi thing to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Lao Kun group, bringing you arms upraised. Um, they're was a funny part of this that I didn't include in the episode just so I could tell you it here. Okay. So when the Lao Kun was moved to Paris, Mm -hmm. we mentioned that the restored, I'm using air quotes there since it wasn't the correct one, the arm that had been attached to it as a restoration had been taken off. And when it got to Paris, this is going to sound like I'm putting France on blast. I'm not. But Napoleon... And his folks thinking, no, but France understands art better than Italians, had their own contest (laughs) to decide what the arm should look like. And nobody entered. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) So that's why the Laocoon sat there with no arm in Paris for uh, 15 years or 17 years, whatever it was. I just thought that was hilarious. They're like, no, that's fine. Um. It's totally possible that our tour guide in the group I was in told us more about this arm. She definitely told us something because I was standing there long enough to take many pictures of this statue. But this was also during, like, the terrible jet lag portion right. <laughs> of the trip for me. So there are some gaps. <laughs> well, and... It was sweltering hot that day. Mm. Um, And this is in a a courtyard that is shaded in some areas and not others. Mm -hmm. And you could find cool spots where they had some air blowing. But if you were out of that cool spot and in the sun, it was like instantly broiling. (laughs) And so that is never good for anybody's concentration or attention span. Um, I was very, very enamored of our Vatican tour guide because she clearly, I think they probably all do, but I only experienced the one, had such a command of art history that anywhere, anytime we walked into a new gallery or room or courtyard, she would kind of see what people were gravitating to and talk to them about that rather than going through like a pat script of place to place to place. And so that might have been why we got a little more Lao Kun, because the second I was like, and his arm was missing, I was like, tell me more, tell me more. Um, (laughs) So so she was really, really wonderful, uh, Alexandra. She uses the X because while she is born and raised in Rome, her family is German, which is why she is not an Alessandra. She explained this to us um, and was spectacular. I was so in love with her uh, because of her, I mean... Uh, Our dear friend that I have known since I was a kid, Fred, was with us on this trip, and he was in my group, and we just kept looking at each other and be like, how does she know so much art history? Like, she knows (laughs) so much art history just off the cuff, uh, and we were blown away by her. And she made it very, very fun. So that was good. I I loved when she was doing her presentation of the Sistine Chapel, which we've mentioned earlier, they have to do before you go in, because you're not supposed to speak in the Sistine Chapel. And when she got to the part where um, she's explaining the story as it's being represented, and she said, and then God created the sun and the moon. And when she did that, she circled a naked butt on the painting. And I was like, (laughs) I am in love with you. You're exactly my person. She was very, very funny. (sighs) Um, (laughs) And I I did sit there staring at the Lao Kun for a very long time. I never would have thought about the fact that his facial expression was not physically possible. No, and there's enough discussion about that that when I was just wanting to hear experts say this name, um, that was one of the things that came up was like all this discussion about eyebrow or eye forehead wrinkles and and furrowed brows. And I was like, man, this is it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. I I mentioned it in the episode that there are lots and lots of papers analyzing the Lao Kun. 
from every possible angle. There are even people that make the case that the now pretty widely accepted as the correct arm might not really be the correct arm no. kind of discussions. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those things that because this is more than 2,000 years old, it's a lot of guesswork. We're probably never going to, you know... I mean, if you don't accept the evidence at hand, you you are unlikely to ever get hard enough evidence that you will be convinced of, yeah. of yeah. anything. I was also pretty charmed in a grab the popcorn and watch kind of way by the discussion that popped up in 2005 after Lynn Catterson was like, I think this was a forgery. There's not really any good evidence that suggests that, but art historians got their hackles so up and they were all, like, putting out statements that it was very fascinating to read about. You can pretty easily find it. Uh, it got covered in, like, the New York Times. It got covered oh, in wow. a, a lot of different places. And almost always Richard Brilliant, I don't know if that's how he pronounces his name or if it's Brilliant, always his non-credible on any count comes up. <laughs> In almost every one of them, because he really, I mean, he's devoted a lot of his life to studying the Laocoon and its interpretation. And so I think most people look to him as the last word. I will say, though, there were a couple of people who were like, wait, but I read her paper and now I'm thinking about it. So even though most art historians say she is off the mark, there are a couple that are like, eh, it's worth considering anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't want to vilify anybody. <laughs> Um, But the thing that comes up for me in that discussion is that she mentions in her research that if you go back and you look at, like, bank records from the time, there was this sudden deposit of money into Michelangelo's bank account. But I'm like, yeah, but there's a missing link to me in the logic because... If this was buried and then found, and of course I'm using the air quotes, with the intent that the Medicis would buy it and somehow he would benefit, like, how was that line of connection and ownership going to be established when it was found in a vineyard, not any property of his? Mm -hmm. So he did not get the tolls from the gate. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Uh, It's just an interesting, fascinating little what if mental exercise to go through but yeah i don't i don't think it's i don't think that holds any credibility personally i'm not an expert but i sure love art so uh hopefully we'll talk about some more art there uh was also i realized while working on this project that uh lessing who we mentioned it wrote a very heady heady discourse on the whole thing including a lot of other things his life story is very interesting so he went on my list for possible future topics uh, and always, whenever I do a show like this and I'm researching it, I bump up against like seven other things I want to talk about. So, you know, shows beget shows. Ah. <sighs> uh, we talked about Lucy Hobbs Taylor this week. Yep. I have been wanting to talk about her since I did that dentistry episode because she's pretty interesting. And I just love how tenacious she was. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, I'll find another way. Fine. <laughs> um, her story reminds me a bit of when I was in massage school because I went to massage school when uh, there was a wave of states regulating massage therapy for the first time. And so, like, a lot of states are figuring out what they wanted to do to require licensure. And North Carolina had just recently passed all the rules. And I was in massage school with a woman who had been practicing massage for, like, 20 years. Oh, and she had to go back for the certification. Yeah, she had to get... uh, I can't remember if there was an option for people who had, like, documented work experience to opt out of stuff, but but she had to get um, a certain amount of the t- formal training from our class. Uh, and I remember her just being deeply frustrated by, like, what she had been doing in her practice versus, like, the basics that we were learning. <laughs> Uh, I think some of it was like, the, like, we had to have a certain number of hours of anatomy and physiology and 
She was like, I've been doing this forever, and now I am here with folks who have zero experience. Right? <laughs> that sucks. Uh, I can only imagine. Yeah, I I didn't find a lot about how um, that one session that Lucy did that one uh, session is a word that I I haven't figured out if they mean she took one course through a semester. Um, it sounds in some write-ups like that was the case, but I'm sure she was just like, great, great, great. Well, at least this. Yeah. By the way, I'm actually an expert on some of the newest technologies being used by dentists. <laughs> um, here's the thing that tickled me. That one um, Vermont paper that we that we quoted from where they talk about her being in New York visiting relatives. Mm -hmm. They never mention her husband by name, which is an inverse of what we normally see even today. Like, even a very accomplished woman will be like, you know, Dr. John Smith and his wife were at the premiere of his wife's movie she directed, and she'll never get mentioned. And I just thought it was funny that this was a rare historical instance where they're like, she married some guy. I don't don't know. Don't know. Somebody. (laughs) Um, it's kind of funny. I also, like you, was very tickled by the dentist who can never retire. Yeah, yeah. Our dentist that we both used to have had a similar situation, except the pandemic kind of put an end to it. Yeah. Because he moved to a different state and was then like, well, I'll move from, I'll come back from my, my home in my new retirement um, location periodically I'll fly back and see patients. And then it was like, flying was not safe at all for a while. <laughs> and he was like, I, I can't do that, guys. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I think he might still be doing it. I think it uh, it might sound unusual to some folks for like the dental practice and the residents to be in the same place. Because, I mean, every dentist that I've ever gone to it's the dental practice and maybe it's in a building that has other medical and dental practices in, but it's not somebody's home. Right. <laughs> but I actually know somebody who's, whose dad was a dentist uh, and had the combined home and practice in the same space. Uh, and then when, when he stopped practicing, like converted the, the practice space into just more living space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can see where that's, beneficial in ways. I mean, it's almost like what we're dealing with now, right? Where most, uh, we certainly are working from home all the time. A lot of other people are. And like, on the one hand, it's so handy. I don't have to drive through traffic to commute anymore. It's very, very easy. I'm, you know, in and out. I have access to my stuff. If at lunch, I want to go sit on the couch and watch TV. But also, there's no separation of your life and your work. Mm. (laughs) It's a, it's two edges, two edges. One interesting thing that I bumped up against in doing research but didn't really fit in the episode was about Eclectic Medical Institute. Yeah, I had not heard of this before. Well, it actually rubs up against another um, podcast subject we've had, which is Elizabeth Blackwell, because Mm -hmm. she applied there uh, while they were accepting women and was accepted. Maybe I heard of this and forgot. (laughs) Well, she didn't she didn't go there because the school didn't have hospital privileges for students. Oh. And she was like, Yeah, but how are you gonna like really learn and take care of patients then? Uh so she she was like, I'm not I'm not going there. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a weird one. I kind of of very narrowly avoided going down a rabbit hole about that institution and its history because I was like, that's not really, I don't need to be bogged down with all of that for this. The important thing is that it took women and then it didn't. So uh, Right. And I, I wanted to just make sure I had those facts straight because otherwise it seems like Lucy Hobbs was like, la, 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 I'll go to medical school without really thinking it through when in fact she had every reason to think they would take her because they had been right. taking women until just before she decided that that was her path, so. <laughs> Lucy's malpractice. hmm Don't love it. I don't love it, especially because there's been some writing recently about, like, the prevalence of overtreatment in the field of dentistry, and I've talked about my own personal story of having a dentist tell me that I needed to get a bunch of crowns and that then no other dentist ever suggested was even a thing. Um, and so the idea of, 
of filling a healthy tooth bothers me. Yes, I can completely. I mean, uh, like I said, it is it is malpractice. <laughs> <laughs> There's no getting around it. Uh, once again, less regulated field at the time. She was not, she did not have her DDS degree. Um, it's interesting, though. I can only imagine how frustrating it would be to have a, a dude roll into your office and be like, well, little lady, do you think you know enough to look at my teeth? Um, I don't know why I did that voice, but I I understand her frustration. Yeah. Yeah. Again, Lucy, I'd rather you hadn't done that, but I get where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it was very interesting to me to try to look for where other women were documented as having practiced in history. It's very hard to find stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, we don't use Wikipedia as a source, but I will go look at it as a jumping off point because they may have connections or list sources that I might have a hard time finding otherwise. Mm -hmm. And there is a a page of like first women dentists in any country, but a lot of them are not links. It's just a name in a year. And so, or the links are in a foreign language that like um, a browser translator won't translate. Sure. And so I was like, I can't verify any of this. Yeah. Well, and we've also talked about how many women there have been who've who've been doing critical work with their, like, husbands and brothers and fathers, and those men could not have done what they did without the work of whatever woman was in their life. Yeah. And it, so it seems incredibly likely that this included women who were essentially acting as, like, uh, an apprentice level work or a, like an assistant mm-hmm. or basically helping treat patients with their husband or whoever uh, and not ever being written down anywhere. Well, and even um, I didn't go deep into her research, so hopefully I'm not spouting off anything incorrect, but even uh, Emmeline Roberts Jones, who we mentioned, who was practicing dentistry in the U.S. before Lucy Hobbs was, she had started out as her husband's assistant, and he didn't seem to think she could handle, like, the actual work of being a dentist. And I don't, there was something she did where she's like, no, I have this. And he was like, oh, okay, well, I guess you can also treat patients then. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I, and she's, you know, documented as having done that. But even so, you don't find a lot about her beyond that one story in any write-ups. So, and that's recent enough that we would have more documentation. So I'm sure there are just kajillions of people that do not have any attribution for their work. Right. Dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful for good dentists. Mm-hmm. If this is your weekend coming up, I hope it is grand and you get some relaxation. If you have a dental visit, I hope it goes smoothly. <laughs> If you don't have time off coming up this weekend and that is a part of your regular work or you have other responsibilities, I hope that those go smoothly, that nothing is too terribly stressful, and that you still manage to squeak out a little bit of time to just do something for yourself. We all deserve it. Uh, You will find us right back here tomorrow with a classic. And then on Monday, we will once again start a week of new episodes. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.